Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Stefano Conversi. I'm here on behalf of my team of work that is made by Professor Karian N. Riva from Polytechnic in Milano and from engineer Norcini from actually uh, Lombardy region, that is the authority, the regional authority in which uh, Milan is uh, located. And um, I will talk about uh, this, uh, this work that is meant, uh, is meant to be the second step actually of, of a different. Uh, of a different project and work, so I will have uh, a little bit of introduction. We will talk a bit on remote sensing for river monitoring and how it is, uh, how it's uh, used, and then we will go through uh, on the first part actually of the work, so the integration of optical and other imagery to enhance river draft monitoring that was presented last year in uh, just past a week, and then we will go through the new part actually that is the optimization of this process towards indeed the automation. We will see why we need the automation in our case study. Uh, we also performed a sensitivity analysis and an elicitation of the best machine learning algorithm, and we will draw some kind of conclusions on both, actually, the works that we are talking about. So, first of all, we know that uh, in the last years, uh, Europe suffered uh, lots of different uh, drought events, and especially in 2022, we had severe uh, drought events that affected all Europe and in our case, in our case of interest, particularly uh, Italy, obviously, and Northern Italy. As you can see here, we have the uh, official Copernicus drought indicator for, um, for Northern Italy, and we see that uh, we have uh, this kind of distributed alert, we can say, in correspondence of uh, Lombardy region and Piedmont region, but more in general, we can find actually this issue in the whole Po River Basin. You know, you may know that uh, Po River is the largest uh, river in Italy, and it's a very, very important, obviously, for a, a different um, kind of ecosystems actually that are regarding it. So, uh, first of all, we can see that uh, lots of different impacts uh, were found on the territory after this uh, and during actually this drought period. So, we had decrement in agricultural production. We had uh, navigation restrictions, even some kind of potential risk of rationing of drinking water. And, so, and does actually uh, leverages, uh, leveraging on this, um, public authorities requested for some kind of measures and innovative tools specifically for monitoring and enhancing their capability of understanding which are the conditions on the territory for what regards obviously a river and during a specific situation such as the drought, but even in peacetime you can say. So specifically, uh, Regione Lombardia asked us for a tool for monitoring and visualizing the situation of the streams. And this is very important because they are in need of such as, uh, we can say, um, maps and even just layers, so that they can send and uh, use these kind of images for communicating with the local stakeholders. Indeed, obviously, there are, se there are several stakeholders that are involved in the management of the river and on the territory itself. So, we decided to address these kind of issues with the assumption of using the surface, so an estimation of the square kilometer surface of the river as a sort of proxy of the drought condition of the river itself and obviously the territory. So we tried to propose a methodology to exploit imagery, uh, satellite imagery, obviously uh, open source imagery, and that, that we take obviously from Copernicus Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 for obviously uh, um, arriving, we can say, to a water map coverage that can be exploited in um, local authorities actually uh, work. So uh, for what regards we can say remote sensing, we know that remote sensing techniques and especially satellite data are used for mapping water and we have different kind of sensors and different ways to approach this issue. First of all, we have the distinction, we can say, between optical sensors and radar sensors. We know that with optical sensors we can explore different uh, wavelengths and different uh, intervals, obviously, of radiation. For the radar sensor, indeed, we, we know and we can study, actually, the uh, backscatter signal that we obtain from these uh, active sensors. With optical ones, we can also obtain spectral indices that can highlight the presence of water, while in general, we can say that for other sensors, we are able to easily recognize the um, presence, actually, of water because it is uh, very particularly responding to these kind of sensors. Anyway, uh, we have different kind of uh, methods for recognizing the, uh, it, especially with the shoulding. Anyway, we know that we have also some possible issues with both of these uh, families, we can say, of satellites and sensors. 
First of all, optical sensor, indeed because it is an optical source, can have some kind of, info of errors uh, such as missing information if an obstacle is in between, obviously, the sensor and the territory, such as in this case, and this is one of our area of interest, you can see that the presence of that cloud, uh, that is not a so compact cloud, a so dense cloud, is a light, a light cloud that is completely obscuring the information that is on the ground. On the other side, radar sensors are prone on, uh, to overestimation, actually, for some kind of issues of backscatter, or also for, for example, background noise, or the presence in some case of soil moisture. And you can see that even in this case, we have plenty of these uh, uh, small lands of water that are indeed not existing on the territory. So what we are proposing, what we proposed actually in the first part of the work, was to integrate satellite imagery from in, coming from the two different sources with a machine learning algorithm for classification that was a supervised random forest classification. And so we took actually the three different bands, one from the Sentinel-1, and so rather imagery, and the other two that are two indices made by optical sources, so the NDWI and the SWM, that is the Sentinel water mask, so a specific indice, two specific indices that are built for detecting water, we use these, these three sorry, uh, stacked bands for um, feeding a supervised uh, random forest classifier, giving also as input, obviously, a set of drone polygons, drawn by photo interpretation, that were uh, obviously containing the information what on the territory is water and what is background. And then we obviously obtain some classified water maps and validate that. We can see uh, some kind of information on the values that we considered and on the production of the indices. Um, obviously, we have then split the uh, polygons, the training polygons, in the two different tests and training set. We obtained as an output a thematic map of water coverage, and then from these maps, actually, we decided to estimate the water surface in the area of interest, and we validated with some kind of methods. Here you can see the results for the two, we can say, extreme results, uh, extreme periods. Mm -hmm. The first one is the worst case in terms of water scarcity. Indeed, it was in uh, August 2022, so during the most severe drought period. And the second part, the bottom one, is, we can say, the best situation, best situation in terms of water amount that indeed was not at all the best because it was after a flood, as you can recognize here. So specifically, uh, we address it as the best situation, but it's clear that it was, it was not. Okay, so um, let's go now with the automation part. So as I said, this tool was meant to support a civil, uh, sorry, not civil protection, sorry. <laughs> uh, it, it was meant to support public authorities and managers of obviously all the stakeholders. Public administration is a, uh, uh, very complex, uh, we can say, institutions, a very complex environment in which we cannot expect to have only remote sensing or GIS experts. So, first of all, if we want to produce a very uh, actually useful tool that can be ad um, addressed and used by almost everyone, we need to avoid the uh, necessity for the user of drawing the training samples by for the interpretation of the imagery. So that was the first point, and obviously uh, all the different possibilities for were considered for automating as much as, pro as possible the process. Then uh, the uh, main idea would be the one of uh, create a real web app that is user-friendly and that can easily be inserted within the procedures of public administration. So uh, what we decided actually to do is to create some way a system that is capable of reaching autonomously a map that is containing only water or non-water pixels to be intended as a reliable water mask from which we can randomly extract training, training samples, actually. So how can we uh, build this kind of mask? Here we have an image from the paper. First of all, we consider the three different satellite inputs, so the NDWI, SWM, and the SAR images, or better, image collection, because we are referring to different images in the same period. And we, uh, we will see how we obtain for each of these three inputs a single water mask. Then we combine this water mask and we obtain the ultimate and most reliable one. So first of all, how can we address uh, the solution so that we can an automatic procedure for, um, for drawing this kind of water map? We decided to go for automatic thresholding through OTSU algorithm. This is another, an algorithm capable actually of individuating the uh, value, the pixel intensity value, 
for which we can distinguish between the two classes. In this case, we need to have bimodal images, so we can distinguish background and foreground, and basically this algorithm is capable of defining autonomous, autonomously, we can say, this threshold value that distinguish, and so basing on this threshold, we can obviously realize a classification of pixels. But this uh, also algorithm, as I said, works only for bimodal images, and we can easily understand that uh, real imagery is not at all bimodal. So how can we solve this issue? We address it, the problem with a, a new version of the Otsu algorithm that it was presented in 2020, that is the BMAX Otsu. The BMAX Otsu actually is based on the application of this kind of the same algorithm on just some kind of small portions of our image. So, first of all, the image is divided in cells. The, the, the dimension of the cell is selected by the user through this uh, process that is called chessboard segmentation. Then each cell is studied through a bimodality test, so the normalized between class, uh, the maximum normalized between class variants is estimated for each of these classes, of these cells, and only the bimodal cells are actually used for evaluating the threshold of the image, the threshold for dividing the two different classes. Then we decided the, dim the dimension, as I said before, we need to es express a dimension, and we decided to work, if you can see there in the, uh, I hope it is uh, actually is it visible, uh, we decided to use cells such that more or less half of the pixel in the cell would represent water and the other half the background. And so we uh, try to uh, corroborate this kind of results and we obtain actually a, um, a formula, a formulation for the grid size so that uh, basing on one of the parameters that the user will know, so the river width, because the user obviously is interested in a single river, uh, basing on this kind of parameter, the, uh, the whole system will work and provide this kind of automation, automated process. So, as I said, we will then extract, uh, we will need to extract from these masks, actually, some kind of training uh, polygons or pixels, actually. So, as I said, with this kind of thresholding, we are obtaining uh, three images collection of masks, because, as I said, each uh, sensor is providing us a series of the images. Then, we decided to understand uh, in these, uh, um, in among these actually images in the temporal frame, which are the pixels that are consistently classified as water or no water over the period of reference. And only the pixels that are constant, we can say, remain into an intermediate mask. Lastly, we consider the three final masks, and only the pixels that are in common among all of the three masks are extracted and put inside the ultimate mask. In this way, we obtain a, as much as possible, as much as possible, reliable mask that is for sure representing water and non-water in the area of interest from which we can extract the points. And the uh, points that will be extracted are then validated and calibrated in the 0.15% of the overall number of pixels in the image. You can see here an extraction from our work. So uh, basically the white areas are the common areas among all the different masks that uh, I, that I mentioned, the, uh, white, the, the yellow ones are obviously the ones related to the water, and then the training and test point, uh, points extracted for water and no water in the blue and red. So, uh, as I said, we also performed some kind of accuracy estimation and so, um, better, we can say a sensitivity analysis actually, for selecting the right amount to be used for, or uh, right amount of pixels to be used for training the algorithm. And uh, we did that by comparing, first of all, three different machine learning algorithms, so the classic random force that was already used in the first project, classification and regression tree, so the cart, and then support vector machine. We did that on different dates, so uh, in different uh, dates coming from even different periods of the year, so you see May, July, and February of different years. And then we tried simply, simply to change the number of pixels that were used for the calibration, and uh, we noticed that actually after a certain threshold that we defined in the 0.15%, as I said before, we cannot obtain a real gain in terms of accuracy incremented, but we would uh, start having some kind of issues in terms of computational time that was too high. Then um, the second analysis that we did actually on the results was to try to compare newly these kind of, uh, these three actually machine learning algorithms, and specifically to 
combine them also with the information of using the single sensor Sentinel-1, so the radar, the single sensor Sentinel-2, so the optical, and then the integration of the two different uh, satellites. What we, can, what we could find, in this case, in real uh, reality, we, we added also a couple, of, a couple more of uh, dates, so this is uh, an exception. What we can recognize is that uh, it happens that uh, the single sensor is, uh, has a best accuracy with respect to the other, but this is not optimal, this is not constant, because, for example, you can compare the S2, so the optical source, in June 2017 and in July 2022, you can recognize this, the same satellite, even with the same uh, machine learning algorithm, is uh, delivering completely di uh, different results, probably because in that case we had some kind of clouds, so something that is uh, obstacling in um, some way the, the, um, the issue. So we decided to go on with the confirmation that the, the integration actually between the two sources is the optimal solution, and it was particularly announced uh, on the SVM, considering all the different uh, dates. So here we have actually the new, uh, the second, uh, second area of study that was, uh, that was used, and this product is indeed completely obtained uh, autonomously by the system, as I said before. So the only input that was requested was obviously that parameter considering the uh, dimension of the river, nothing else. So, in general, we can conclude saying that, as, uh, as I mentioned, the integration is actually quite effective in mapping water, the integration of the two sources, that this methodology is actually, in principle, repeatable with whichever kind of couple of optical and radar sensors. The validation that we did, actually, in the different, uh, in the different periods uh, and different uh, iterations, you can say, of the project is actually proving this effectiveness. And even we have some kind of correlation with ground truth data, such as uh, the, the mentioned hydrometric level comparisons. Still, obviously, this whole uh, project stands on the fact that data should be good and should be available. Imagery should be available. So this is still, obviously, an issue. Without the imagery, you cannot obtain good results. Then uh, this methodology for now, given that we need some kind of time for having the information from the satellites, cannot be used for real time nor for near real time actually analysis of, in the ter of the territory, but for medium term monitoring indeed it can be used. Another aspect to be considered is that Google Earth Engine actually needs a specific uh, agreement with a public administration to be used. And so if we want to deliver a, a real product to, uh, to Regina Lombardia, it will, it, it will be um, a point to be addressed. And lastly, we, can, we will go on with some kind of code refinement. Everything is based, sorry, in the Google Earth Engine, I just mentioned it, uh, by the way. And uh, we want to enhance the aspect of window, the time window selection because we are not so satisfied on how it is working for now, and try to reduct, reduce once more the number of parameters that the, use, the user has to define so that the system could be as much as possible autonomous, as I said before. Then we obviously want to validate the system also in other areas characterized by a different geomorphology of the territory because obviously the, char the physical characteristics of the river are very important for having good results. So the, uh, this system is optimized on Po River in all those areas for the moment, but we will. Uh, uh, we want to export as much as possible this, uh, this solution. And then, as I said before, the real goal is to produce a real tool and a web app that can be maybe also hosted still on the Google Earth Engine platform or even with other tools to be uh, given to Regional Lombardia so that they, have, uh, they could have a real tool to be used in monitoring and managing actually risks that are related to the climate change that all of, all of us are actually living. Uh, here we have well, the uh, screenshot from the, the paper, and uh, most of all, if you want, here you can find the QR code with the first uh, work, so the one of integration of satellites. Here you find the second one with this, uh, this work, and then also the Google Earth count, uh, code if you want to see how it is uh, built and uh, how the work was deployed. So thank you, it's so from me. So if you had some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, really interesting presentation. Um, we see a lot, let's say, a lot of papers every now and then in the literature that compare different but fairly similar algorithms for those type of classification algorithms. And uh, I was wondering um, from, let's say, 
anecdotal evidence <laughs> um, uh, that the uh, support vector machine is in tendency a bit slower, it takes more resources uh, than, than other uh, algorithms. So is, is that an issue that, that this uh, is, feels more heavyweight? Okay, actually for, can you hear me even without the mic? Okay, so, okay, so I will do this. Yeah, actually we consider all of the different uh, possibilities and uh, different comparisons and combine, combination. Also uh, consider actually the computational time and all the, the required information. And uh, it, it appeared to be the best, uh, best solution, at least in this area of interest. And these two areas, areas of interest, because actually we started the uh, river but in two different sections. So the, the first one was, the, was a, a smaller, you saw before the, the mapping, the river mapping. And then this other one was la much larger, so given also more information and uh, um, a potentially uh, more complex situation. And still comparing uh, all the process and all the procedure in five different dates, uh, in five different years and different periods of the year and so on, we, uh, we got this kind of information that the evidence is that SVM with the integration is the most uh, suitable and most reliable actually product. And uh, obviously all of that was validated. The, the um, first part of the sensitivity analysis was validated through ground truth uh, uh, that is uh, coming from uh, photo interpretation. So it is quite reliable. And uh, in this other case uh, for defining exactly which is the best performing algorithm, we used as a reference the result of the first iteration. So, of the, well, we used as a reference the water map obtained by the original method that still is based on photo interpretation on the new area. So. It's not something uh, uh, out, so we can say validating, but we, we try to use as much as possible some ground truth that is not so easy to get, so it requires that you draw manually all the polygons. Other questions? Hi. hi. Yeah, uh, my question is uh, if you have verified that the measures of flow uh, are uh, like uh, yeah similar to your result because if you know the section of the river, if you know the yeah the flow, you can uh, you know uh, retrieve also the yeah that area. Uh, for now, we didn't consider the flow as a, uh, we can say the, the dynamic aspect is, is uh, a bit disregarded. But what we did and what we want to do actually in future is to try and understand, as I mentioned before, if this system can work also for different kind of rivers. Because uh, uh, with the, especially with this new implementation actually of the code, uh, we can insert different parameters that may be uh, used for fitting as much as possible the whole system on a um, river that is characterized by a different morphology. For example, if you have a river with a uh, quite narrow, uh, narrow surface or even characterized by lots of different uh, curves, uh, it may be uh, more difficult to obtain some kind of good results. And um, this, uh, this is a problem even because actually we are working with satellites that give us uh, uh, 10 meter pixels. So we cannot uh, uh, apply to to uh, narrow actually rivers because we cannot uh, see anything otherwise for that uh, for that reasons. But still, we are uh, working on uh, several different aspects on this uh, project. So we hope actually to be to, to find a, a solution that tunes as much as possible on different areas in, of interest. Uh, at least, given that still it is a project that is uh, triggered, we can say by this regional authority, we want to be able to cover as much as possible the principal rivers of our region. So yeah, if you're Italian, you know maybe Ticino. Yeah, yeah, Ticino is maybe the, the most complex one, but we're, we're working on that. Other questions? Hi, right, thanks for the presentation. So, uh, I have a question on the new study area. Uh, are you retraining all those models, you have separate model for those study area or uh, you have a single model that you want to on the new study area? Oh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> for those new study area, you have separate model for those uh, area for study or you just have a single model that uh, for single model that you want to on those new uh, area?
Yeah, actually, we use uh, always the same model by changing the, the input information, and so specifically the imagery from the different dates that are provided directly within the ecosystem and environment of Google Earth Engine, directly by Copernicus. So we are working on the same system, just changing, obviously, the, the, input, uh, the input imagery. Other questions? Um, I'm not familiar with that region, so I have to ask you, uh, did you have a problem also that you have like water plants, like reed obscuring water, or tree canopies uh, over the water, and, or did you have to address this kind of issues, or this is not a problem for your study area? Thank you. But we are actually um, aware that the presence of different, uh, I can say, uh, vegetation or even buildings actually close to the to the river can be some kind of, can create some kind of issues. Uh, what I can say is that uh, uh, anyway, being that the, our sources have a 10 meters resolution as ground, uh, it's very difficult to have uh, a large uh, coverage actually of vegetation that can create some kind of of issues. Nevertheless, we are estimating also the validation on the whole area, so it is possible indeed that we have some kind of small issues given that uh, we can have some kind of obstacles, we can say, for the, for the sensors. Still, we can say that combining actually the two different sensors can also help us to remove some kind of issues that can be, can be uh, created by those, uh, those information, such as uh, I can uh, uh, just tell you uh, one of the problems, for example, of the SAR, so the, the radar one for the um, detection of water is the possible presence of uh, solids, uh, so actually of objects, you can say, inside of the water that can give some kind of strange responses. Uh, while if we combine this information with the optical one that is indeed visualizing and distinguish between the water and that object, uh, uh, the results show that actually the combination can easily, uh, easily can effectively, we can say, actually uh, cover the, the deficit that is coming from the other one. So. More, we are aware that these kind of small issues can still be there, but overall it is quite satisfying the results on our point of view.